Hello subscribers and welcome to this edition of our subscription video. And I'm here alone today because I'm going to talk about a coffee that's very special to me. It is of course Kieni from Kenya. We're very uh, proud to present this coffee to you. It's a uh, cooperative in Kenya, uh, right in the middle of uh, Kenya in uh, the Nyeri region. Nyeri is probably the most famous coffee region in Kenya. A lot of the highest quality coffees for a number of years have been coming from that region. Kieni is a cooperative with 1000 members. Each member represents typically a family that grow and nurture their own trees. They take care of them year round. They typically have a variety of crops uh, growing on their farm or their shambas as they call it. And they uh, pick their own cherries and deliver to this cooperative wet mill where the coffee is processed and they all share whatever comes in the funding to that cooperative. They grow the varieties SL28 and SL34, which are the old typical varieties in Kenya. But in the recent years, we've seen a lot of uh, farmers starting intercropping and uh, growing a lot of Bachian and Ruru 11. In the coffee world, there's a lot of uh, sort of skepticism towards these new varieties because they tend to not taste as great when we do blind cuppings compared to the SL varieties. But for the farmers, the, the yield, the resistance to uh, different pests and plagues and drought is a little more important for them than the taste quality, unfortunately. However, the good thing in this region is that a lot of the farmers there are keeping their old SL 28s especially. Uh, so I think that's one of the reasons we are seeing so much of the these kind of like really berry-like uh, flavors in the coffee. Now, Kieni is a cooperative that we've been buying from for nine years this year. If you look around the coffee market, there's a lot of changing of Kenyas uh, because they most of the selling in Kenya is based on their, their own auction system. That means that uh, the exporters will be tasting the coffees that come in every week during the harvest season, and they're bidding against each other for the best lots and then exporting them. That means that what a lot of people are buying from is whatever the exporters have been buying on the auction. And that means there's a lot of, how to say, uh, changeability. There's a lot of uh, exchange, a lot of, um, this is the flavor of the year for a lot of people. We don't think that's the best way of working if you wanna work long-term with the same people and wanna see them grow and develop the quality. So uh, nine years ago, we decided we really wanted to find a cooperative to work closely with and try to stick with them. We found Kini actually a little by coincidence on the cupping table the first year. So we bought the first lot then, brought it back to Denmark. It sold like hotcakes. When we went back the next year, it was again one of our favorites on the cupping table. So we kind of knew we'd struck something really precious at that point. Now in Kenya, the coffee is sold through, uh, as I mentioned, the auction and all the cooperatives are represented by different marketing agents. That can sometimes pose a challenge as well when you want to work directly with the cooperatives. But um, since we have a very close connection with Kini, we followed them through now three different marketing agents. We told them that whoever they want to market their coffee will do our best in terms of staying in close relationship with Kini. It also means that we have a really uh, sort of strong personal relationship with especially the chairman, Charles uh, Murimi, who is elected by all the members of the cooperative to represent them and to sort of lead the way, sort of like a CEO in a company. On the actual washing station or the factory, as it's called in Kenya, Josh Pat is uh, the mill manager. And Josh Pat is a, a very warm, very funny, yeah, very heartfelt guy who, uh, who does an extraordinary job at Kini. It's his responsibility that First of all, when the farmers deliver cherries, that he overlooks the quality of what they deliver. He has a crew on the washing station who will go and monitor and say, this coffee needs to be sorted better. And the farmers will actually sit down when they arrive at the collecting station, take out all the cherries that they harvested and sort through them. And the coffee is not ready for actual delivery until someone at the mill have approved the quality. So there's a huge uh, step in that already in educating back to the farmers and saying, you need to do a little better job in picking and sorting your coffee, or you have these issues in, uh, in pests or something that I can see is affecting your cherry quality. 
When the coffee is approved, uh, it's been put on a scale uh, so they can weigh the amount. And uh, Kini, uh, I think two years ago, invested in a digital scale and an electronic computer before everything was handwritten in triplicates. Um, so the farmer gets a receipt straight away for the amount of cherry that they delivered and everything is calculated. So they deliver cherries to Kini about three times a week during the peak of the harvest. So you can imagine it's quite a lot of small deliveries that each farmer comes in with. All that is accumulated in the system. So at the end of the season, they can say, how much money did we get into the cooperative? And based on the kilos of cherry you delivered, you get paid out your dividend. Then the coffee is ready for being put into the hopper, the collecting hopper. And from there, it's being deep hopped in a, in a disc popper. And you'll probably see pictures from Kenya. They kind of all have these uh, vertical disc poppers. Uh, at Kini, they have four of them in a row. Uh, and they're quite clever because you can, uh, if, if the machine operator is good at his job, you can uh, s sort of adjust them to only squeeze the really ripe cherries. And so underripes won't really be squeezed out and you can sort them away. From there, it goes into the fermentation tanks where the coffee starts naturally fermenting overnight. Uh, and the next morning, Jospad will go and sort of, um, how to say, rub the coffee between his fingers and feel if the mucilage, this gooey, sticky stuff covering the, the beans, have been dissolved yet. Uh, the fermentation uh, is bacteria and yeast in the air who will start to eat away at the sugars and break down this mucilage. Um, as it's doing that, it transforms the taste of the coffee. Um, but primarily the reason that, that people historically have been doing this is basically just to remove this mucilage. When Jospad rubs it between his fingers, he can feel has it dissolved enough or does it need to ferment more. Uh, if it needs to ferment more, sometimes it's just an hour, two hours more, uh, and sometimes it's done. Then he'll do what's called the intermediate washing. And this is something that is also something I pretty much only see in Kenya so far. A few other countries have started to adopt this as the, the Kenyan method. But the intermediate washing means that even though all the mucilage isn't gone, you do a washing process where you put in clean water into the tank. And at Kini, they have two rows of tanks. One is situated a little higher than the next, so they can put water into the first, wash the coffee as it flows into the second tank. That washes off, let's say, about 75% of the mucilage. And the last bit of mucilage that's left is then left to ferment for another couple of hours. And Joshua will say it can take, sometimes it's done at that point, sometimes it needs to ferment another five hours. It's all depending on the weather, the humidity, and the activity in the microorganisms. After that, the coffee is thoroughly washed. And this is why it's called a wash process, because then it goes into washing channels. Clean water is agitating the coffee. You stir it with paddles up against the stream, so it's mixed around. And in that process, you actually have another sorting step, because all the lighter beans will flow on top. So they will flow down faster in this stream in the washing channels. And by putting these little inserts in the channels, they can sort out all the light ones for quite a while. And at that point, you kept the heavier, better qualities in the washing channel. Then it's been put into soaking tanks, which is both used as part of a, an additional washing, and but also as a storage tank to keep coffee there until they have space on the drying tables. They physically uh, sometimes move them by hand to the drying tables, but can also have a, a pump system so they can pump it up onto skin drying tables, which removes the majority of the water. They're situated at, at a very slopey hill at Kini, so all the water can go down. And then it's moved again by hand over to the real drying tables. On the drying tables, they're drying for uh, between eight to 14 days. It's a slow process and should be slow not to damage the beans. During uh, noon, they cover it with, uh, with these sheets so it doesn't get too much direct sunlight because that will damage the beans. Uh, sometimes they move it into a, a, a storage facility to not let it dry too fast and then take it out the day after to kind of slow down the, down the drying. And this is quite important because if the coffee dries too fast, the coffee will lose a lot of its flavor and it'll taste dead when it arrives in Denmark. We'll also typically see a lot of woody notes in the coffee a few months after it's arrived. 
they dry down to about uh, 10 and percent moisture content and at that point it's ready to be delivered from Kini from the washing station of the factory to a dry mill at the dry mill the first thing that happens is you uh, you uh, hull the coffee so you remove this parchment skin that's covering the beans and then you remove stones and twigs and whatever else could be in there and then you start to grate the coffee first into sizes and this is where the double A and the AB comes into play because all that AA and AB refers to is the screen size. So the coffee beans are moving through screens at different uh, hole sizes. Double A are the largest one, AB are behind, then comes C, and then you have actually a variety of smaller um, gradings below that. Typically, most uh, or typically always actually, uh, the double A's goes for higher price than the AB's. Uh, of course, the reason is that they look better, they typically also taste better, but that is not always the case. We've seen some years where we actually preferred the flavor from AB's. And I'll definitely say that the coffee from a single factory and maybe even a single outturn from that factory can taste better in the AB than coffee from another factory or even another outturn from the same factory. So we very much depend our, uh, or base our purchases on the flavor quality of the coffee in that regard. The ABs uh, can be sometimes a little less acidic, a little less flavorful, um, but we've seen some years where they actually had a really nice upfront acidity that we uh, really liked. Of course, the most important thing I think as a, as a roaster is that the beans are the same size when it comes to roasting. It's a little bit like when you boil potatoes. If you have different sizes, it'll affect the uniformity of your, uh, yeah, your potatoes, in this case, your roasted coffee. Flavor-wise, I think they're super interesting and it's kind of fun for us to present these two side by side so you have a chance to present them side by side at home. And hopefully you'll give us some feedback on what kind of flavor nuances did you discover in the two different sizes. We have again this month roasted them a little bit different for espresso, so they're more suited for espresso brewing at a much higher strength than for a filter brewing, which is a lower strength, but maybe a little more bringing out the top aromas in the coffee. We hope you all enjoy it, and uh, we'll make sure to pass your regards to Jasper and Charles at Kini. I know they are super stoked to have their coffee being sent out this month. Thank you very much.